So our next panel discussion is particularly delicious, and I think it follows the medium is the message principle that we heard a little bit about in the journalism panel. Um, it's all about fermentation and how it can rebuild our food culture. And I think there's two additional bits of context for this panel. One is that if the mission of um, edible magazines is to celebrate and chronicle food businesses, uh, these are some of the food artisans and entrepreneurs that we have chronicled, we like chronicling, and do that with the, the, the goal of the, seeing their businesses grow and thrive. And two, you might have heard that when Michael Pollan was interviewed recently about whether he would add any additional nuance to his simple three rules, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, he said he wished he had said, eat some fermented foods as well. So I think we're going to learn a little bit more now about why that's the case. And to moderate our, moderate our panel, um, uh, we invited uh, An Andrew Smith, uh, who is a professor at the New School. He has taught food controversies, food history, and food writing courses uh, here since 1996. He's the author uh, or editor of 26 books, including Eating History, 30 Turning Points in the Making America of American Cuisine, and the Oxford Encyclopedia on Food and Drink in America. Andy, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, being a good teacher, I have a handout. Uh, so we are handing out the bios for each of our speakers here so that we can spend the time with the conversation. We, we have been engaged in this conversation for the last half hour, and it has been wonderful. Um, one of the really good things about planning a conference is that it really is a, a kind of a drama. You, you have to head to the end when you have the high point, and this is the high point of our drama here for the conference. Uh, I just wanted to point out that it is still time for you to call your mother, just in case you may have forgotten. Um, good news and bad news. The bad news is my knowledge of fermentation is limited to alcohol, which um, I think Perhaps many of us have that knowledge on. The good news is we have four panelists that are extremely knowledgeable on fermentation on uh, other subjects. Now, what I've been amazed with is this love-hate affair that we've had with microorganisms. Um, and uh, for at least thousands of years, fermented products have, have been part of people's diets. Uh, we just happen to have um, uh, Jessica Childs with us, who happens to uh, be a co-owner of uh, Kombucha Brooklyn, uh, and uh, was certainly the former owner of the Tempe shop in Brooklyn as well. She happens to be a molecular uh, biologist. So what is this love affair that we have with fermentation and fermented products? Well, I could tell you about my own love affair with it. Maybe that would inform you as to the history of our love and kind of recent um, aversion to it. Um, I started off as a molecular biologist, and some of you may know that to do molecular biology, you must be very proficient in microbiology. So when I was uh, in school, I remember having these really wonderful late nights in the laboratory with my friends, culturing everything that we could find. Now, this is before I really understood that fermented foods were actually, um, you know, foods were transformed by bacteria, right? So we're in there and we're like, you know, picking our little ears and culturing it, waiting a couple of days and see what comes up and, you know, between our toes and like everything, the bathrooms, we were just culturing everything. I know that sounds crazy, but I learned some really interesting things. Number one is that, um, well, I guess I'm just going to say one thing. The one kind of big thing that I learned during that time was that the same things that I cultured off of, you know, things in my environment were the same things that were present in things like cheese or things like wine. And it was later that I made the connection. I read this article in the New York Times, I think it was, when I was working in a lab about this guy who was making kombucha in his house. And I said to myself, oh my gosh, I can culture these things at home. Like, ding dong, hello. Because um, I didn't come from a family who did any of that. Um, I was always a big pickle fanatic. I loved things that had fermentation in their nature, but I didn't realize what the process was, was exactly what I was doing. So when I discovered I could ferment things at home, it was like a revelation. I was so excited, and I started culturing everything. I realized how easy it was to culture things. And as part of this process, I started, um, you know, is, is when, you, when you start reading about things, you start learning some of the history of it, whether you kind of intend to or not. And I became really drawn in by the story of fermentation, about how, um, how ubiquitous it was 
throughout history and how it just all of a sudden died um, through you know refrigeration and through the industrial food revolution. I mean, I could go on and on about it. I only have a short amount of time, so I'm going to keep it brief. Um, but it is uh, something that I feel uh, our our current food structure is sorely lacking. Somebody once told me um, that you only have a certain number of words before you die. I think his mother had told him this when he was a child because she wanted to you know, keep his talking to a minimum. But I think that there may be something about there's only a certain amount of food breaking down that our bodies can handle before they start to kind of peter out. And all this complex stuff we put into our foods and uh, all this um, you know, kind of sterilization of it, it prevents the breaking down of food to happen before it goes into your body. So when you, when you ferment things, it breaks them down to a point where they make it much more easy to assimilate the nutrients out of it. So I think there's something to be said for having some of your food broken down before you eat it. <laughs> one of those products that have been fermented uh, for years are, are pickled products of one sort or another. And we just happened to have Rick Field, who is the CEO and chief pickler of Rick's Picks. Um, and so I, I, had, I had the first question for you. Uh, did you really get your recipe from your mother? This is what I want to know. I did indeed. And um, I would like uh, to salute all the mothers out there, past, <laughs> present, and future. Uh, and of course, since we're talking fermentation, we can include vinegar mother. Um, but uh, yeah, no, for me, um, and I think it's important to clarify at the outset um, my relationship to this topic. Um, you know, I, I belong to the larger discussion about food preservation, um, and uh, my, the products that, that I make with Rick's Picks are, are shelf-stable, acidified food products in jars. So we do home canning style pickles. So it's a little bit different from um, you know, what you would uh, traditionally associate with a barrel fermented style pickle, but I think um, you know, the larger discussion around preservation of food uh, is very interesting and, and complex, and you know, that's, that's the place uh, you know, where, where we live. And, and for me, um, making pickles indeed um, was a family, a family pleasure that resonated very, very strongly with me as a child growing up in New England, and um, I uh, came to New York uh, with an entirely different agenda. I was an English major, so that meant I was fluent in my native tongue and not really qualified to do anything else. But I was determined to be a, a filmmaker. Um, I spent a long time in that universe, working mostly in TV, actually. Um, and while doing so, I kind of rekindled this interest in, in these family pickle recipes that I'd made as a child. Um, and uh, I lived right next door to Grand Army Plaza Green Market, where I got to know Gabrielle very well from the, the previous panel, um, and um, started working with the produce from those uh, from those farmers to, to recreate these family recipes and eventually started to branch out from there, from the original mom recipes, kind of using what I call soup logic, meaning when you make soup from scratch at home, it's never quite the same one time to the next. Um, and, and that was an interesting and a fun process for me. And then um, one thing led to another, and I turned 40, broke up with my girlfriend, lost my job in television, and won a pickle contest pretty much within a four-month window. And so... Obviously, the universe was telling me to start Rick's Picks. And so actually, in large part, thanks to Gabrielle, I don't know if she's still here. Did she leave? She was here. Anyway, Gabrielle helped me to get a, a stand at Union Square Green Market. And um, uh, we began making uh, and selling the pickles there. Well, not making them there, but selling them there, using produce from the Hudson Valley. Um, and uh, you know, that, was, that was the beginning of, of Rick's Picks. Our third panelist is Siggy Hill-Marson. He is the founder and creator of Siggy's Dairy, which makes skier. Have I, have I pronounced that correct, Siggy? Um, so um, the, the obvious question is, did you really get this recipe from your mother? Now, the story is on the internet, which we all, of course, believe entirely, is that you couldn't go back to Iceland to get your skier, and so you ask her for the recipe, and she gave you the recipe, and you made it right here in New York City. Uh, yeah, I started uh, fermenting in my apartment, um, and uh, it was the first Christmas I didn't go home to Iceland after I moved to New York. And my mom actually scanned in a couple of articles at a local library, uh, which I used as the basis for my first batch. Uh, those are really old recipes, so I didn't really get the measurements right to begin with, but uh, I kind of somehow struggled through it. and. Uh, 
eventually it started to taste acceptable or okay. Um, and you know, you kind of learn by trial and error. I was not a microbiologist or, or, or a chemist, so uh, I, I used these sort of old, old style recipes first, and then I, I used the internet just to educate myself in general about how to improve them. Can you briefly say what is skier? Skier, skier is the strained strained yogurt of Iceland. It's like the the oldest food that used to be the sort of staple of the Nordic diet. It died out everywhere except in Iceland, uh, and it's a it's a kind of a fat-free yogurt that was a byproduct of butter making. So it was what uh, the Vikings did with the skim milk after they had made butter, which was the most uh, easily transportable and, and sort of most nutritionally dense mass. So this was their second base. Uh, and, you know, the word skier is probably connected to the word to cut or shear, mm -hmm. which is the English variant, uh, because the ideal version was so thick that you could almost cut it. Um, so it's, it's a pretty old style product. And, uh, um, you know, growing up in Iceland, you almost don't think about it. It's such a default default product, kind of like a bagel in New York or something, you just, it's always there. So moving to New York and not having it just, I didn't really realize how odd that felt, so. Our fourth panelist is uh, Eric Child, who's the kombuchman, is that, is that how, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Uh, he's the founder and CDO, uh, CEO of Kombucha in Brooklyn. He also is the co-author, along with Jessica of Kombucha, the amazing probiotic tea that cleanses, heals, detoxifies, and energizes, which is just released last fall. Uh, so how did you get interested? You, you told me that you first tasted this and you didn't like it. Is that correct? Kombucha. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I, I wasn't looking for um, a life-changing food when I was handed a bottle of kombucha. Um, I was in a really stressful place, both with my body and my mind. I was working on 57th Street in the art world, and my face was covered with red bumps, and my stomach a bubbly pool of acid. Um, it was a very uncomfortable life. Uh, and I would consume all sorts of um, store-bought medicines for my stomach and spend all sorts of money on my face, in night creams, day creams, dermabrasions, you name it, and nothing really worked. Um, and then one day, my... my uh, Coworker came in and she had this big bottle of, of bubbly liquid and she didn't know what it was either. She bought it at the health food store because it kind of, it looked different. Um, and it was very sour and kind of sweet. Uh, it was bubbly, you know, three things that I like, but I wasn't really, you know, it didn't really mix. Nothing I'd really had before. Um, and so I was like, okay, yeah, something kept, Something kept making me go back to the bottle. It's one of my favorite parts about fermented foods. People keep coming back. But, um, you know, because I kept drinking it, my body started to change. I noticed that I wasn't getting heartburn, which was daily. Um, and then within a few months, my skin started to turn into what it is now, which is a shining, shiny, uh, shiny skin. Um, and my energy levels really increased, and I just kind of became a happier person, as strange and uh, esoteric as that sounds. And, um, you know, people were calling me the booch man long before I had kombucha Brooklyn, because I was like, you got to get on this train. It is awesome. Uh, and, you know, I, I emailed, I reached out to the biggest company in, in the, the world who makes kombucha out on the West Coast. And I was like, we need more of this in New York City. We are all about toxins here. And um, I think there needs to be somebody pushing it. I'm your guy. And he never wrote back. So, uh, you know, I got some money from my grandfather who passed. I also broke up with my girlfriend. And uh, that, those two things coinciding led to the formation of Kombucha Brooklyn, which in the beginning was all about liquid kombucha, making kombucha, putting it into a vessel, and then serving it. Um, and over the past five years has grown into what I like to call a one-stop kombucha shop um, and also an education hub for fermentation. Um, Jessica and I have really built... Um, a, a very diverse company. Uh, we do have your traditional offerings of kombucha in a bottle blended with grape juice or strawberries and ginger juice or watermelon juice. Um, and then we have a very, very uh, sustainable, delicious on tap program where you have a bottle and you take it somewhere and they re refill it for you. Um, and then a few years into business, sort of to save the business, we launched a homebrew kit, a kit with everything you need inside of it 
uh, to make kombucha. And um, there really wasn't anything like it, at least as easy as we made it and as attractive, uh, as, uh, um, as beautiful as we made it. Um, and, uh, you know, those kind of just took off. And what was a homebrew kit has now become a complete homebrew supply line um, and a store where you can buy Sander Katz's books and, um, you know, during the holidays, other types of fermentation kits. Um, and then with the book Kombucha, um, which is the real pronunciation of the book, um, uh, we have paved the way into really teaching the art of fermentation in our learning center at the old Pfizer building. We actually make kombucha in the old Pfizer building in Brooklyn. Um, although they did start their company with fermentation too, if I'm not mistaken, making citric acid or penicillin. They made penicillin, which was a fermented medicine. Thank you. Um, anyway, and um, here we are today. So can you tell us briefly what kombucha is? <laughs> I used to just say kombucha is a fermented tea. That's the easy answer for this panel. And now I say to everybody, kombucha is probiotic like yogurt, fermented like beer, and bubbly and delicious like soda. Now you all know what kombucha is, um, or at least kind of what it, it tastes like and makes you feel, so. Uh, each of you have started a business, and some of you have already alluded to this. Um, do you have any advice for people who are starting businesses on, on, uh, on, on any product, but fermented products in particular, other than not to compete against what you're doing? Oh, I welcome competition. You love competition. It's called co-opetition in my world. Um, you can only get, get from your, your competition. Um, but I would say, I'm sorry, I, would, I had the mic, I might as well keep going with it, um, capital. Um, money. It'd be great if you had a source of money to live off of for the first probably five years because you're not going to make a dime. Don't expect you will make a dime for the first many years. Uh, and then focus and plan. Uh, choose one thing that you're really good at and focus on it. Uh, and have your plan. Business plans aren't just something that they taught you how to write in business school. It is your business in a book that you can keep going back to. So when the world gets shaken up, which it happens almost every week in your business, you can go back to this document and say, oh, that's what I stand for, or oh, that's what I wanted to do, so. Um, and then I'll let my, my co-chairs add on that. Uh, other advice or comments? Jessica? Uh, I'll go on about the, the focus thing a little bit. Uh, I think that we are a really great example of a company that, um, that kind of struggles because of the diversity we've invited. It's a wonderful, we really enjoy it. Um, and it's brought us a lot of, uh, of great ideas and great contacts. Um, but at the same time, you are essentially running three different businesses by having three distinct product lines that have three distinct buyers and three distinct distribution routes and all of that. So if you are thinking about starting a business, um, I think that Rick said it really well, stay in your lane. And I'll probably iterate that better um, in a moment. But you know, just kind of picking one area, a couple of SKUs and focusing on that uh, pathway for a while until you get established. Rick, you started off with nine products? Yes. Um, staying in, in your lane is something uh, that I've come to understand the importance of um, over the years more and more, um, you know, partially by having only semi-observed it at the beginning. Um, yes, I, 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 you know, continue to this day to make uh, shelf-stable pickles in jars, but I was committed at the beginning to having nine products. These were the nine top recipes that I had developed over the seven years that I'd incubated them in my home kitchen in Brooklyn. And what that means is that basically I had nine different things to worry about um, from soup to nuts. Um, of course, there are similarities across the different products, but you know, each one, of course, by definition, is kind of its own thing. And I think that if I was going to do it again, there's a um, an axiom that I developed when I was in television, which was my previous career, which is uh, one is an idea, two is a concept, three is a campaign. If you have three examples of anything, um, you can kind of prove it out. It's an advertising idea. If you think a lot of advertising campaigns, you know, are composed of three actual commercials. Um, and so if I was going to start over again, I probably would have picked the three products that I felt um, gave me the best way to express myself um, both in terms of sales potential and market differentiation and just worked really hard on those three. Um, to this, you know, when I look back on the original nine, gosh, um, I, think, I think only four, four or five of them survived, you know, to this day. The others came up that were better. Um, the marketplace, you know, told me that some of the things that I thought were awesome maybe weren't quite as awesome. 
Um, and also, you know, I think there's some logic to the idea that if you, if you give a consumer fewer choices, um, sometimes they're more likely to make a, cho a decision, uh, you know, because if you give somebody, I've, I learned this by sampling, and you put out a, a sample of nine different things, people are like, oh, kind of, what, what's going on here? Um, but if you have three, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot more clarity around that. Um, the other thing that I think is really important too, and this is a very unsexy thing to say, but it's crucial in thinking this through, is do you love paperwork? I know that sounds like a really horrible thing to say, um, but the bottom line is that, you know, we're here celebrating the best, the best um, of what we all believe in, what the, you know, the local forward mentality can mean, and that's fantastic. Um, and, and right on the money. But the, the bottom line is, is that when, when you're running a business, um, a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff that you focus on, in fact, the vast preponderance of it, um, has less to do with the, the, the urgent passion that you brought to it in your home kitchen and more with just the mundane realities of running a business. You could be making automobile tires or, you know, um, earplugs or, you know, uh, uh, you know, really almost anything. Um, how are you running your business? What makes it what makes it run well? What are the pain points? How do you address those? And those have less to do with sourcing, you know, credibly uh, from a local farmer, and more about making good business decisions. And so, what I try to do, recognizing that that's my reality, is to always have something sort of out there that I'm a carrot that I'm dangling in front of my face, something new that I'm thinking about that inspires my imagination and keeps the original passion alive. Because otherwise, you know, you just turn into a paper pusher, and that's no good. Siggy? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe just the first one, uh, how this relates to cultures, cultured patterns in particular is that uh, just experiment. Don't be afraid to experiment if you're starting a cultured business. Um, you know, things are not always going to taste great, but eventually you're going to get the hang of it. Uh, and if you're doing things in a home setting, there's obviously so many environmental factors that will be solved eventually when you get to a more professional place. Um, and then I sort of, the second point is, where are you going to sell your product? Um, and as, especially when you're beginning, the product is not totally homogeneous. It's, it's a live product. It's going to be a little bit different uh, every time you make it. <clears throat> you know, the cultures react differently if the outside temperature is a little bit higher or lower. The, uh, you know, my product, milk, the milk is different in the spring, winter, summer, uh, fall, and that makes the product a little bit different. So. Uh, some places require the product to be too homogeneous and then the consumer gets a little bit upset. So you want to kind of pick your battles, you know, what can you do with limited capacity to begin with and then as you grow and you learn how to control your process a little bit better, you kind of can branch out into sort of more, you know, how should I say, mainstream uh, outlets to sell your product. But I, I pretty much echo what all the other panelists said, that focus is crucial. and. If you, if you think about it, when I was starting, I was this kind of crazy, weird guy from Iceland, and, and, and if I had to tell people... You still are. <laughs> yeah, I know, thanks. I feel like I've simulated a little bit, but, but I, I'm grateful for keeping the roots. But people only have capacity to remember a uh, so long pitch, so try to keep it kind of short and, and, and focus on one thing, and then people, ah, yeah, you're the, you're the yogurt guy, but if I had had like 10 different food products from Iceland or something, it would have been uh, probably a little bit more difficult to, to, to sustain a pitch and, and have people remember me when I came back. How did you move from, each of you started working in your apartment or working in your residence and experimented around and then you made the decision to begin to promote this. Is there something that helped you move from an idea into actual reality? Is there anything that you can think of? A couple of you mentioned you had some luck um, with um, Murray's cheese. Is that it? Yeah. Well, oh, oh yeah. I mean, um, for me, it was, li was literally winning the pickle contest when all those other life events happened. Um, and, and, and then I began a process that's it's actually sort of similar to what happens when you, when you decide you want to buy a car. You need to have a driver's license. You need to know what car you want. You have to get the car registered and inspected. You need insurance. And those, all of those things need to happen in a very sort of specific sequence in order for you to be street legal. And the same is true with starting a food business. Um, my, my, my competitive advantage early on was, was the fact that I had Gabrielle. Uh, uh, as, as a friend who, who helped me to navigate the waters uh, at, at Green Market um, and to get that, that stand at Union Square, which um, 
you know, a good, a good booth in a farmer's market is like a pulpit or a free infomercial. It's, it's invaluable because you've got the most discriminating shoppers, the bloggers, the food buyers coming through, not, you know, casually, but as a matter of course in their weekly activity. And you will get trial as a result of that. Ironically, I didn't know this till today, but both Ziggy and I, Ziggy and I, uh, you know, our first major client was Murray's Cheese. And, you know, that was a great springboard um, for both of us uh, for different reasons in different ways. But... Um, I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah, it's good enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Siggy. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I pretty much had a similar experience. I, I, I hated my day job, and um, I was making the yogurt as a hobby, and uh, a friend of a friend was uh, Liz Thorpe, who was the, one of the buyers at Murray's Cheese, and she sampled it with her store people and told me that uh, a couple of months later, actually, that if I was making it regularly, they would buy it. So, uh, you know, I figured that, you know, quitting your job when you know you have a willing customer, somebody who's actually going to willing to put up cash for what you're making, uh, you know, puts a little bit of a, or gives you an indication that you at least have something that has commercial viability beyond your own kitchen, so. Okay, Eric? I Jessica. think some people are sort of born to be serial entrepreneurs. I think I was one of those. I started my first business when I was like 14 years old, making little trinkets and selling them at the uh, arts and crafts festivals around. And I've had several businesses. Uh, I hear that uh, most people, most successful business persons have uh, at least seven failed attempts under their belt before they have their, uh, their, their thing that kind of establishes them. And I think I finally found mine. <laughs> I only had three failed attempts, thank you. Um, with fermentation uh, and sort of seeing non-local fermentation led me to kombucha Brooklyn along with those other two points but i was on the l train one day and i saw seven people drinking a bottle of kombucha and just a few years back i saw nobody drinking kombucha but seven people and it was all the same kombucha from the west coast and i had been making kombucha and i was like this isn't the way it should be done you should you should drink a bottle of kombucha pretty pretty quickly right after it comes out of its fermentation vessel you know, and New York City is huge, and we got to have a local booch. So um, that sort of gap in the market uh, and necessity in the market for something that was growing so fast, I thought was like it had to be done. So um, that was that was a big drive to get really fresh kombucha to the people of New York City because we are awesome. E each of you have expanded your product line. Uh, at least you had started with one thing, or maybe tried nine, but you, now you have a number of different things. Uh, what, what else are you doing? Rick, you want to start off? Um, well, we, uh, I guess the easiest way to describe um, our expansion is to think of it in terms of sales channels. So um, the, the vastly greatest part of what we do is, is products that we sell to distributors, which take our pickles to places like Whole Foods. Um, and then uh, we've got an expanding and, and a very exciting part of the business working with um, restaurants, institutional dining rooms, places like Shake Shack is a good example, caterers um, with bulk versions of our top selling items. Um, there the method is a little bit different. Um, we do a, a pasteurizing process with the retail jars. That's what makes them shelf stable. Uh, the bulk versions of, of Bricks Picks, uh, the vegetables go in, the brine is brought up to temperature and it's poured over uh, and then capped and refrigerated. So the result uh, in that uh, instance is a product which is a little more fresh vegetable tasting, a little bit less pickled, if you will, because it hasn't gone through that pasteurizing step. Still has a good shelf life, um, but must be refrigerated. Um, the differences are fairly subtle, but you know, to if, if you tasted them side by side, you'd see a little bit of a difference. And then, you know, we do online sales, um, not with the kind of, um, you know, numbers that I'd like to see, because that's a whole art unto itself. Um, and then we've got a couple of uh, secret projects in the works um, that you'll hear about in the next couple of years that are different from these. You're not going to give us a hint at all. Um, well, you know, I think I think there's an opportunity to um, to, to bring uh, an individual pickle um, nicely packaged um, into the marketplace, and we're working on that. Okay. <clears throat> Jessica, yeah. Um, expansion. I'll sp I'll speak about the homebrew supplies expansion. I'll let Eric talk about the expansion of other departments. Um, in the spring of 2013, 2012, it is. 
No, no, I'm talking about, okay. In the spring of 2013, we won a grant from the city, um, actually from the NYCEDC, and with that money, we pretty much put all of it into kind of fleshing out our homebrew supplies line, which had been a, a small part of our business beforehand. Um, we had a small web presence. It was kind of a, you know, rickety old website, and it was really hard to navigate. And uh, we had, you know, uh, just the brew kits, essentially. Um, so with that money, we, we really, you know, focused on creating an internet portal. Um, and I think that the aftermath of doing that has really changed the nature of our business. I don't think we really understood um, just how, uh, I guess, expansive of a move that could be. Um, since we did that, we've, you know, we have, I think, 75 or 100 different products in our, in our web catalog now. Uh, we have, uh, you know, social media people who are constantly keeping people up to date on what's going on in the web store. We have, we just launched a, a, a program, like a kind of members only program where you obtain coins, they're called. Um, and, and since we did that last year, uh, the brew supplies have become greater than half of our, of our revenue, and that's a huge leap. So, uh, so the brew supplies are doing well. <laughs> and we've got lots of plans for them in the future now. They're kind of, um, they're really becoming something that is nurturing our business tremendously and ourselves. You know, it supplies a lot of, uh, a lot of our staff with uh, lots of activity, full-time activity, which is wonderful. And I'm, yeah, I'll speak on the, um, the liquid portion, which is talking about fermented foods and expanding the production of them. Um, it's a very interesting uh, arena to, f to find yourself in because unlike uh, what we will just say, you know, traditional foods that you find on the store shelf, there isn't really a store or a book on to how to commercially produce fermented foods. I mean, there are some very specific ones, but um, you know, I can't tell you how many commercial kombucha facilities I've seen that are literally an expanded kitchen, one gallon glass jars over and over and over, and over thousands of one gallon glass jars, because that's what they did at home. Uh, and I think uh, fermented foods in particular are an interesting thing to, to uh, expand upon because you're dealing with microbes and microbes on um, a one gallon level versus a 5,000 gallon level are going to react very differently to, its, to their environment. So, um, you know, as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur, I think that, uh, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit really helped in failing so many times and trying to make bigger batches of booch. Um, but, you know, we are, we make pretty large matches of kombucha. Uh, and um, there's a lot of things that go into working with co-packers that don't go into working with co-packers who don't do fermented foods. Um, a lot of QC points, quality control points, um, that don't exist in other uh, food production methods. But with certain fermented foods that are being consumed raw, um, uh, it's a very diff different world. So. Okay. What, what's the future of fermented foods? Do you have any general comments? What did you ask? The future, yeah. The future of fermented foods, yeah. oh man. Uh, it's an exciting future and I, I, I you know, I'm sure everybody, uh, you know, Siggy and Rick feel the same way about their products. I really think kombucha is, is bridging the gap between, um, you know, traditional foods and fermented foods. Um, you know, kombucha is, is not just sold in health food stores anymore. Um, uh, yogis and hippies are not the only people drinking kombucha now. Uh, kombucha is growing really fast and, it's, and you're starting to see it on all sorts of store shelves. Um, and um, you know, I think it's, it's proving that, you know, I, like, I like to say that the pendulum is swinging the other way after the, the industrial food revolution. We are now turning back to um, these old, old methods of making foods uh, and these old types of foods and we're, we're putting them into um, that traditional food market. So I think that uh, more more, uh, more fermented foods will become more mainstream. Um, and as that happens, people will start to make better choices about where they're getting their foods, um, sustainability in terms of the way foods are packaged. Um, and, um, you know, that, that, that energy that the pendulum is bringing going back into these, these um, fermented foods will really d hopefully define a, a bigger change uh, in the way that we consume. Jessica, what's the future? 
I am really excited to see uh, fermentation coming back to public awareness. I feel like, uh, well, I, I know for a fact that food is our biggest interface with our environment. Um, we actually, you know, we take food and we stick it inside of our bodies. And when you take sterile food just over and over again, um, sterile kind of beaten down processed foods and put them in there, and that's the only thing you're putting in there, you're creating a, a breeding ground for a host of, um, of discomforts and disease. Uh, whereas if, you're, if, you, if you cultivate, um, I mean, just, just a more natural way of, of eating, just eating things that ha still have all the stuff on them that they came out of the ground with them on. You know, like a cabbage comes, you know, packed with all kinds of bacteria and things on it that can, uh, that can help populate your gut. So just becoming, uh, you know, a society of people that has more of that, I think we'll see a, uh, a greater sense of like vitality and health in our people if we if we kind of remove ourselves a little bit from the uh, from the you know the expiration dates the fear of food antimicrobial everything antibiotic things I think if we encourage a little bit of a love for our microbial you know environment I think we'll uh, be a better people a more creative people. Um, I think we'll be more flexible and more adaptable to the things that are coming in the future. I think that they're something that uh, we would be very, very sad to uh, shut out like we have. I think we need to encourage their prosperity. Siggy? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the two things. The first one right now is that uh, getting people to actually appreciate the, f the taste of fermentation without any additives. So in, in, and what I mean by that is in, in my case, the yogurt, uh, yogurt in America has way too long been basically a sugar delivery mechanism. Uh, and people trying to mask the real taste of fermentation, which is the sort of tart taste of yogurt when the pH drops, uh, which is kind of an acquired taste. And people have for too long tried to mask that with you know, uh, sugar or, or sweetness. Uh, or worse, the artificial sweetener. So I think that is gradually going to go away. Uh, we are trying our best to sort of limit the amount of sweetness in our products uh, and people sort of gain real appreciation and, and develop a palate for the, the actual taste of fermentation, whether it be kombucha, uh, yogurt, or what, I, what have you. And then I think the next one is, is to just gain, build on that and gain uh, sort of a palate, that the people will gain a palate for more complex fermentation taste. Uh, for example, in yogurts, there are a couple of different versions of yogurt that are ne not necessarily as popular because they have you know, different flavor profiles and, and shorter shelf lives that um, you know, could become sort of the next wave. You know, we, we, we both make a, a, a regular yogurt that has a sort of a thermophilic process, which is more sort of a high heat fermentation. But then there's also a slower fermentation, sort of a mesophilic fermentation that's kind of more buttery, a little bit softer, but you know, suffers from some processing restriction that make it uh, uh, not viable for like very mass production. So, um, you know, just the, the consumer gaining more of a profile uh, of real fermented foods that don't require additives to be enjoyed. Greg? Yeah, just to pick up on that thought, um, you know, we say all the time, life is sweet enough, life is salty enough. A lot of pickle companies will um, infuse their products with tremendous amounts of refined sugar and wildly high salt content, um, both of which you know we refrain from um, because we think there are a lot more interesting ways to drive flavor and a lot healthier choices that you can make. So I completely agree there. Um, I think a larger point, though, um, you, know, you talk about what, where, does, where is this all headed? What does the future mean? Well, okay, so we're in the Twitter age now, obviously, where you know, whatever is new or whatever is trending um, is, you know, very appreciated. Um, the traditional methods that we're talking about here, you know, go back thousands of years. You know, Mesopotamia, China, depending on um, where, where you see the point of origin. But we're talking, you know, m millennia. Um, and I think that um, there's an appreciation, even as we get into this, you know, light speed era, uh, for, for this kind of uh, patient approach. Um, we live in an age of screens, right? You stare at a computer all day at work, you're on your phone on the way home, and then you pass out in front of a TV when you get home. And we're living in a very disconnected way right now. And all of the products that have been talked about today involve a kind of a tactile connection with you know, real substantial um, 
making of things. And I think that that, that, that sort of spirit is very important right now to a lot of people you know, in an age where technology is kind of pushing us in the other direction. And so it's, it's a great time to sort of uh, engage in the most intimate way, which of course the most intimate way would be microbial level, um, you know, with, with our food supply um, and make it as, as dynamic as possible. So I, I think it's a kind of a ceiling unlimited moment. The, the title of this panel is Fermentation Can Rebuild Our Food Culture. Can fermentation rebuild our food culture? Absolutely. freaking lutely um, You know, when I, when I talk about fermentation to either kids or people who have no connection to it, I say fermentation is change, right? So you can simply say that uh, um, our food culture just needs to be fermented a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, really, I really think, again, that it's about the pendulum and um, it's swinging the other way. People are making healthier choices uh, and fermentation um, I mean, fermentation is a big business. You sort of pushed away beer and wine a little bit when you first started talking. Man, alcohol is, is the biggest business in the world, and that's a fermented food. It's simply a fermented food, and because of the way it's, it's marketed to us or the way we consume it, people don't really look at it as such, but fermented foods are, they kind of do control the world. I, I've heard so many times, beer built the pyramids, beer, beer dictates, you know, are, are the, the way the, the whole world flows. So I think fermented foods already are kind of making a, a big difference. Um, but uh, I think that now uh, that portfolio is becoming more diverse. And as the diversity grows, then um, it will continue to make uh, as big of a change as alcohol does. Um, because I, I, alcohol does dictate everything, now that I think about it. Uh, I always say if I wanted to make money, I should have started making uh, beer instead of booch. Um, but, you know, we're getting there. And I think where we were five years ago is very different than where we are now. Uh, and kombucha companies are sprouting up not just in Austin, San Francisco, and Brooklyn, but they're sprouting up in the middle of Pennsylvania uh, and the middle of Idaho. Uh, and that's where your, your change happens right there. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and I, I was talking earlier about how uh, when, when you start you know, getting into a topic like fermentation, you start learning a little bit about the history of it. And uh, I think that people, when they discover what fermentation is and how maybe their, you know, their grandparents were making sauerkraut or they're making miso or whatever the cultural heritage is, um, I think that it, uh, it really grounds your, your place in this world to, to uh, be aware of what sustains you as a, as a human being on the planet and what has sustained all of your ancestors and what will probably sustain, you know, your, your um, offspring and so forth. Uh, so yes, I think that it will not only change our food culture to readopt our, uh, our historic practices of fermentation, but I think that it will also change our culture. Uh, I think that, the, that fermentation and, getting, and becoming aware of, of the more subtle qualities of our history and our, and our, our health and our life um, has the potential to even reconnect people and get them off of those screens. I know that making sauerkraut, for instance, I mean, you, don't, you, you can make it in small batches, but it's more fun to make it in big batches, you know, get a big old crock and stuff it full. And in order to do that, it takes a tremendous amount of elbow grease to kind of pound that cabbage down to a, a nice uh, fermentable texture. Um, and so whenever I do it, I like to enlist the help of my neighbors and my family. <laughs> so it turns into a social event. So yes, not only our food culture, but our culture as a whole. Siggy? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not the only thing that's needed, but you know, like uh, uh, has been alluded to, it's, it's, it's a live food and it's connected to everything that's around us. Uh, back in the ages in Iceland, the way people used to, to gather cultures to make the yogurt was they would take a cup of fresh milk or five or six of them and distribute it around the farm and then what they would do is they would uh, let it sit overnight. It was fresh, raw milk. And the one that would sat best, i.e. Um, take the best cultures out of the air, because these were air burnt cultures, yeasts, I guess people didn't really know at the time what they were doing, or sort of on a microbiological level, they didn't know. But then they would take the best one that had, had sat the best, and they would use that as their first starter. Um, and then what they would do is they would propagate that starter over and over again 
So it would be basically kind of like a living being with that family. And, and then if the starter died, they would do the same thing again. And I think that's kind of sort of, I don't know, like a, I don't know what the right word is, a metaphor for like the life cycle is, is that the cultures al almost became like a member of the family, you know? And what would happen is that, um, you know, if you ran out of culture in the middle of the winter, because if you put milk out in Iceland in the, in the winter, it would just freeze, is that um, you would have to ride to the next town, which could have been really far away to get their family cultures if they survived. So, you know, you, you have this thing that's kind of like almost a member of your family, member of your culture. Um, and I think, you know, that brings you closer to your food. It brings you closer to what you're eating. And, and, and if, if that is a part of taking the food culture out of the sort of the big, you know, monolithic factories, I think then that's, that's a good thing. Okay. Rick? Um, I think that, you know, we've hit on a number, I'm sure the other panels that besides this one did as well, on a number of distinctive virtues of our food system, and we certainly hit on some here. Um, I think the important part, though, to recognize is that the group in this room is uh, a fairly closed circle in the sense that pretty much everybody, I'm sure everybody here, is, is on board with a lot of the ideas and the themes and the sort of the belief system, if you will that goes into um, the, the products that we're, that we're making here. Um, in order to effect that, that kind of lasting permanent change, um, the, the campfire that is this needs to be a bonfire. And somebody mentioned, um, Eric, I think you mentioned like kombucha uh, companies springing up in, in places that you wouldn't expect. Um, and I think that, that, that signals the greatest um, strength and potential for, for the future. Um, you know, we used to say glibly in the early days, you know, if, if, a, if a Democrat voted uh, for whoever a Democrat voted for president, that's probably where we're going to be successful with Rick's picks. Um, and, you know, getting out into other parts of the country and getting the messages out in places where, you know, they, they've, they're less likely to be initially receptive or more, more historically prone to be uh, of adverse, averse to them. I think that's, that's really critical. And, and I think that you guys, you know, have, have that opportunity with, you know, the range of locations that you guys are doing your work in. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting time. There's a lot of work to be done yet. Okay. We have a few minutes for questions or comments. You've answered all the questions. There's no need to, uh, no, no. Is anybody here? We have back there. Hi, thank you for your insight. I'm new to the kombucha world. Booch. Um, I did not like it when I first started, but I just want to be more educated on it. Now, I've got a couple of bottles in my refrigerator now that I'm afraid to drink, because it's been a while, but is there an expiration first? And what does kombucha do differently than apple cider vinegar and or probiotics would do? Probiotics would do. Uh, the first, first thing you should do is go to kombuchabrooklyn.com because there's a wealth of information um, on kombuchabrooklyn.com that uh, will answer those questions and more. But um, essentially, kombucha producers are making vinegar. It's a very complex vinegar, um, but one of the, the predominant vinegars that's formed is acetic acid. Acetic acid is apple cider vinegar. Um, uh, accompanying acetic is lactic, malic, eusnic, betraic, all these different acids. Um, so you're essentially making a preservative. Um, and so in terms of expiration, you know, kombucha doesn't go bad. Um, the the lot living enzymes in the bottles, um, you know, they are active and they're eating the food that's present in the environment. And when the food ceases to be present, um, uh, so do the enzymes. So there's a, a life for the probiotics in the bottle. Um, but, you know, I've, I've drank five, six-year-old bottles of kombucha that are awesome and become a different thing. Secondary fermentation changes the flavor and the whole structure uh, and becomes a different product. So definitely don't ever toss out old booch. Um, because it is awesome. But there is a sell-by sell date for commercial products? Yeah, and that's a, it's a good point. The sell-by date really is to dictate alcohol content of the kombucha. Um, when secondary fermentation happens, that's yeast eating, um, um, 
sugars and other ingredients, and they are making CO2, which is also making ethanol. So CO2 is a byproduct, uh, or ethanol is a byproduct of that process. So um, alcohol levels tend to go up, and a commercial kombucha producer making non-alcoholic kombucha needs to be under a certain threshold of, of alcohol content, which is actually half a percent, 0.5 percent. Um, and so that expiration on non-alcoholic kombucha, which there is now alcoholic kombucha being sold too, um, is there to protect that. So your bottle is probably boozy, probably at around 1%, one percent, one and a half percent maybe, if you're lucky, and um, um, probably tastes really, really good. And then the other question, Jessica. Is there Will. a difference between kombucha and apple cider vinegar? Um, well, they're, they're very closely related. They both, uh, or I, I should say, it depends on how the apple cider vinegar is produced. Some apple cider vinegar producers uh, dump in very controlled um, cultures, say of like very specific strains of yeast and very specific strains of bacteria that ferment to make this very, very acetic acid heavy uh, vinegar. Um, and then others like apple cider vinegar that one would make on a farm would be a lot more similar to kombucha um, in that it has probably a more diverse portfolio of, uh, of microbial activity in there. Um, but they do start from very different um, nutrient solutions. Like uh, kombucha starts with tea as its, as its kind of backbone. So there's all of the, the components of the catechins, all of the antioxidants that are tea specific, and then apples obviously have their own you know, vitamin C and all of their you know, compounds. Um, during fermentation, a lot of that changes, but a lot of it stays the same. So, for instance, fermentation won't change the content of vitamin C in either product. There's, there's vitamin C and, and tea as well. Um, so, but, so what you start with informs what you wind up with and how you culture them, uh, depending on where you're getting your apple cider vinegar from. Like, I think Bragg's uses an open air container, and I say that because there's often uh, more kind of yeast and, and growth in the bottom of those containers. So I think that that's probably a pretty wild and, uh, and diverse ferment. Um, so, I hope that answers your question. Another question? Oh, down here. Hi. Thank you. Um, this was really very interesting. I'm a pretty active fermenter. Um, I also have a small raw milk dairy, and last week for the first time I was visited by the state inspector. And so I'm assuming that you're all pretty familiar with all the legislation going on around what's legal, what's not legal, what we can do, what we can't do. Uh, Weston A. Price, I don't know if you talked about that, it came in a little late. But where do you see that if we're looking at, if we're really going to rebuild our food shed and we're going to start having live foods, how do you see us moving forward? Because I've talked to a lot of senators and governors and they don't even know what's going on. They have no idea. Do you have a platform? Do you have ideas? Are you engaged? I'd love to hear about what you're all doing. Thanks. Real, real quick, I'm not going to take this um, uh, full question, but the kombucha industry just um, started an association. It's, it's the industry's first um, kombucha brewers international, and there are 48 of what are now probably in 60s, high 60s companies in the country that are a part of this association. And there are different committees, and each committee focuses on a different piece of the kombucha industry, and one is legislation. Um, but education is the biggest piece to that question, uh, both to educating your inspector, who probably doesn't know anything about what you're making, um, and has a, a guidebook that was written in the 50s and 60s, uh, and uh, education to your, your local politician. And I'll Pass on. Anybody else? I, I, your raw raw milk dairy, yeah. Um, I think isn't there's like a there's a structure now where it's legal to own shares in, in your dairy cattle. Is that correct? You know I, the whole the whole scare about milk is really interesting. You probably read the book, the, the Untold Story of Milk. If you haven't read it, it's a really fascinating book. It's well written. Um, it's a great read, and it talks about how the industrialization of milk really, uh, really kind of sent the quality of milk down the tubes. So it's a really interesting question, um, and I think that it is, it's difficult because can you imagine a raw milk factory producing like, you know, whatever you buy in the store that's mass produced, or, you know, I can't, I just can't imagine a system where raw milk would work on that scale, on like, a, on like a national or international scale. So that being said, I do think that creative solutions 
um, like the co-oping of the ownership is interesting. Of course, there's, there's limitations there. It's somewhere between. I feel like people, you know, consumers need to be really involved with, uh, with their food producers, know them, and, uh, and be aware of, you know, of what they're attempting to do, and they need to, you know, creatively find ways to, to, um, to make it possible to do those things in ways that are, you know, still safe, because, you know, the, the commercial, the industrialization of food, making massive amounts of, of, uh, of one product in one place is just a kind of dangerous thing. I don't think that our, our, uh, our natural environment is set up for that kind of monoculture, you know, to, to do it safely. We have four panelists who had an idea. Uh, some of them started in their kitchens um, with their ideas. They um, launched a business um, and they survived for almost 10 years for each of you and they've thrived and I think that's one of the best signs to me that uh, fermentation can rebuild the food system. So my congratulations to all four of you. Doing a spectacular job. We're going to, um, for about two minutes, invite Michelle Murphy down to talk a little bit about Taste Berkshire. Michelle, are you here? Come on down. So first, before I start, I just want to say hello to Pete. My fiance is watching right now, as are both my mom and dad. So happy Mother's Day and hello from New York City. I'm Michelle Murphy. I'm from the Berkshire Visitors Bureau, and I'm here to promote our Taste Berkshire's campaign. The Berkshires have a deeply rooted food culture, and we want you to come to the Berkshires and experience that. Well, where's the Berkshires? The Berkshires are in Western Massachusetts. There are some people in the audience who've come up to my table and have said, hey, we're from Pittsfield or we're from Sheffield. So thank you for coming to the city with, with me and spending this time and listening to this wonderful conversation. Playing right now are just some images from some local farms around our county. I also encourage you to pick up Edible Berkshires, beautiful edition. It's just amplifying our long history of small-scale food production and all of that local foraging that we love to do. And we want to get you guys out there also, get your hands dirty, climb some mountains, and experience that beautiful mountain air. I also encourage you to grab a copy of our guide. Our table's up there. It's a wonderful tool if you're planning a trip. And of course, you can visit us online at berkshires.org. So thank you for taking the time and listening.